Today is uh, some people consider to be a sort of a landmark day in Washington. Uh, for the first time, we are told, in our nation's history as the House of Representatives convenes to start this new session, they're reading the Constitution aloud. And uh, that's going on probably right now as we speak with uh, different ones of our eminent leaders taking turns reading the Constitution. Now, I hope for them it's not the first time they've read it, but I, I expect that is not the case. But once someone does that, it probably will have an imprint. It's not unusual in other kinds of organizations where people get together once a year if there's a basic document that defines the purpose and mission of the organization. To get together around the table and say, let's read what we are about. And let's not forget what we are about. And so, uh, it's sort of interesting that we're doing that. Along with doing it, I think there are high expectations that somehow this time is different. Um, that sounds like the title to a Gothic novel, doesn't it? This time is different, honey. Uh, that, that somehow this time is different. And so there are some expectations that, that maybe uh, we'll come to grips on some basic issues that we face as a nation. I'm not optimistic that we will see sudden and dramatic change because that's not the nature of our political system. I would expect we would see gradual, marginal changes, but they can be very significant. But what I want to explore with you today uh, is not so much bootleggers and Baptists. They're always lurking in there somewhere, and maybe we'll brush up against them. But the question, is freedom preferred? Is freedom preferred? And I have three parts to the presentation, and one or two of them may just get chopped away as we talk. Uh, but first, what happened to the great American bread machine? What I call the great American bread machine is our economy that feeds us. What has happened to it over time? Uh, in a sense, it's sick in many fundamental ways, and, and we want to look at a little bit of that and say, well, what's happened? And then, why? Why is it that these people called Americans would, through time, fundamentally change how we operate through our government and what we do through our political system? Particularly so starting in 1970, and we'll look at that in a minute. Now this is to suggest to you that the problems we face as a people did not start with the Obama administration. They didn't start with the George W. Bush administration. They go way, way back in our history, but I prefer to identify 1970 as a sort of landmark point, and we'll see why. But things began to happen starting in 1970. That's more than 40 years ago that have built up gradually to put us where we are. So, so the question is, what has happened and why? Is it something about the people that have changed? Now on the theme, is freedom preferred? When we study the movements of people, when people move in the United States from one state to another, when we model their behavior statistically, building models to identify the determinants of their movement, is freedom preferred? That is, we put in a variable that measures freedom for states. And when we look at the results, do the results tell us that people moving in the United States move toward freedom or away from it. And I'm talking about a particular group of people that I consider to be critical to any nation, particularly ours. Uh, it's a group of people that Tate and I call the go-getters. These are people who are 25 to 39 years old. Now the reason we use that category is that the census tracks that age group and it's as close as we can get to the most dynamic and most mobile part of our population. So when people move, do they move towards freedom or away from it, or are they indifferent to it? Then exploring a little bit further, which we've done recently, if we look at how people move from other countries to states in the United States, let's call those international movers, when we look at international movers, do they move towards freedom? When we compare that to domestic movers for the same time period, do international movers move the same way? 
with respect to freedom as do domestic movers. So we're getting at this question, what explains this? Is there a preference for freedom? And then finally, where do these preferences come from? I wouldn't suggest that we're born with them, but there is some work that suggests that we are predisposed in certain ways with respect to cooperation, less so with respect to freedom. And what I'm referring to is work that is being done now in neuroeconomics, work that's being done in evolutionary psychology, and also some work that's being done by some really fun writers. You might want to read some of their work. Uh, Matt Ridley's book, which is sort of a landmark, The Origin of Virtue. Or Michael Shermer's book, The Mind of the Market. These are books that are exploring the biological makeup of our brains and how it is if we go back a million and a half years and look at our ancestors and what it took to survive, then to say those who survived learned how to cooperate and those who did not cooperate, their tribes did not survive because populations of people survive as groups. And that says biologically we are predisposed to cooperate. And that suggests we are predisposed to solve problems collectively, which cuts against a predisposition for freedom. If that's the case, and we have populations of people who seem to prefer freedom at the margin, where does that preference come from? And so when we get to that point, if we make this long trip, we'll be exploring the work of David McClelland, a brilliant uh, Harvard psychologist, long since dead, and his book, which is truly fabulous in my opinion, is a book titled The Achieving Society. And where does this motivation for achievement come from? How do we get it? And now if we put all this together, if we would be successful in weaving all this stuff together, then it would uh, suggest that we might have something to say to another generation of people with respect to freedom and how you get it. That's the idea. That's the outline. Now, the backdrop to this slide, as you can see, is, uh, is a pretty interesting picture. Uh, it's a picture of the Earth with the lights out at night. And in a way, the location of the lights identify for us those places and those people who have what you and I might call modern industrial economies. They've got electricity and lights. And where we see darkness, those are regions of the U.S. and place of the U.S. and world and other places where industrial and economic development, as we tend to think of it, just has not occurred. Now, if we, uh, if we were to focus in very closely on this map, and perhaps those of you who are on the first row can do so, you can probably identify Japan sitting out there. Um, Let's see if we can see it there. We can see the Japanese island sitting there. And if you stare real hard, you would begin to think that you were seeing South Korea with some lights. Uh, now, there, there's a little bit of an enlargement so that you can see that. And, and so now you're looking over at the Korean peninsula. And you're able to compare the results of a natural experiment. A population of people with the same genetic stock with the same prehistory, with the same kind of religious preferences and other cultural features, but a dramatic difference in outcome. And there's one light in North Korea, the capital, when this picture was taken from outer space. And, and there we see the result of what might be called a natural experiment with respect to freedom a population of people that have a lot of it, relatively speaking, and a population of people that have very little of it, and, and there's the result, at least in terms of per capita GDP. And so here we have some kind of statement about does freedom matter, do people prefer it, and then why do they prefer it, and, and so let's take our next step. What about the great American bread machine? Uh, what can we say about this great American bread machine? Uh, particularly, uh, we're, we're in a climate uh, today of uh, still worrying a lot about this great recession. 
have we turned the corner or not? I think we have turned the corner. Uh, will we pedal fairly quickly in our recovery? I kind of doubt it. But we are recovering meaningfully. And so there's good news out there, but the great American bread machine is sort of sick. But we don't want to overlook, we don't want to overlook how powerful it is. When I do studies on the current economy, I refer to it as the 90% economy. We have roughly 10% unemployment. In the best of times, we have 5% unemployment. So we're 5% away from the best of times. That 5% is very important. But we're a 90% economy, which is to say, as conventionally measured, 90% of the people in this country who want a job have one. Now, I would suggest that you explore the rest of the world and see how many places you can find where you could make that statement about the adult population. And so, even a 90% economy here is pretty, pretty, a pretty powerful thing. Uh, some people forget we're the third most populous country in the world. All right, there's China, India, and the United States. Now, I left China and India off this chart so that you could see the good old U.S. American bread machine sticking up there very tall. So, so, you know, many of us would not think if I had given you this question as a multiple choice exam, I expect a lot of you would have missed it. I would have missed it a year and a half ago. I didn't think the U.S. was the third most populous country in the world until I started plowing through this data. And it says, well, so what? It is people that create wealth. And the more people you have, the more wealth you can create. And if you have a growing population, then you can forecast growth in wealth. So not only are we the third most populous country in the world, we have a positive population growth. We are the only advanced country that is reproducing at a rate that increases the population. The rest of them at the margin are disappearing. They're getting smaller. We're getting larger. And so the great American bread machine is pretty healthy on that score. Now, in addition to that, something like 70% of the population, uh, I beg your pardon, it's not 70, it's 40% of the population has an income of $70,000 or more. And so not only are we big, lots of people, growing population, we are rich. That is, a huge share of the population has a very handsome income. You can't find that in other locations. It, and so, hey, this is stuff to feel pretty good about. You say, well, isn't this great? Uh, let's go home and celebrate. Let's get a bottle of Prosecco out and get out the flutes and, and drink a toast to the great American bread machine. But we've got some problems. What I'm showing you here is a count, an annual count, of new pages in the Federal Register annually going back to the first year when the Federal Register was printed. How many of you have ever read a page from the Federal Register? All right. Well, if you begin working in any area of regulation, Federal, you will read some part of the Federal Register. It comes out daily. By law, any new or changed regulation must be published in the Federal Register. And so what you're looking at there is a count of the number of pages in the Federal Register going up through 2009 and starting in 1940. Now, way back there at the beginning, you can see a little toadstool tick sticking up. That's World War II. Had lots of rules and regulations that had to do with regulating prices and allocating scarce stuff. And then you see the regulations began to fall down after that little stool. But if you let your eyes run to 1970, that's the inflection point. When suddenly, we begin to have an explosion of rules and regulations. It's as if the population called Americans woke up one day and said, Damn, we don't have enough sense to wash our clothes or pick out our glasses or drive our automobiles. We've got to have some rules that are going to protect us from our stupidity. And so, yes, now inside your blouse or your sweater or your jacket is a tag required by federal law that tells you how to launder that particular garment. 
it's because we don't have enough sense to wash our clothes. And we realized that about 1970. On the backside of every square yard of carpet that is sold in the United States are instructions saying how the carpet must be cleaned. Not only does it tell us how, a glossary of words is provided, and those words have been approved by the federal government. Only those words may be used. And when you walk through your drugstore and you're looking for aspirin, if you were to see a sign over where the cold medicine is located and the sign said, cure for the common coal, those people would be sued by the Federal Trade Commission because no cure for the cold has ever been found. And that's a lie. So we have rules and regulations that we get used to, and they are covered by these pages. Now the tall, tall bar that you see there, that's the last year of the Carter administration. And there's a, there's a phenomenon, if you begin to study these numbers, as I and a lot of other people have, called the Cinderella effect. Right at the end of an administration, when one party is going out and another party is coming in, what do you suppose the incentives are with respect to printing pages of rules? What's your forecast? More pages or fewer? You want to push a lot of midnight regulations. Midnight regulations. And Mr. Carter, at the last, in fact, most of those rules were printed the last day of his administration. And so, if you were to study this time series systematically, you would find that for every administration, when there is a change of party, you get midnight regulations. It's not something about Democrats and Republicans. It's something about public choice and motivation and incentives. And so we are wrapped up with rules. And you see that collapse that took place in the Reagan years. I was a part of that administration. They limited the number of pages of rules. That is, the only way they could get them down was to regulate them. And so that meant we had to write, use smaller fonts of type and use wider margins, narrow margins, and somehow get our, our rules out. And then Mr. Reagan comes out of office and a, another great president comes in and he says, turn on the printing presses. And the rules start over again. Well, here's another problem, and we hear a lot about this one. This is showing you deficits. Now, I have a couple of lines in the chart. Uh, if you see the green line, that's zero. That's zero deficit. The red line is 3%. Anywhere between zero and 3% is considered to be good territory for a growing economy. If you're running 3% annual deficits or less and your economy is growing at greater than 3%, you can pay for it. And that's why 3% is considered to be kind of a safe boundary. As you look at the charts, you can see those periods of time when our country fell below the 3%. And that first sink that you can see right there, that's the Great Depression. That first sink is the Great Depression. Now that was one terrible time with 25% unemployment. I suggest that you might want to compare that to the Great Recession, which is where we are now. With the Great Recession, we're approaching 10% deficits. With the Great Depression, we were hitting four and five. The Great Depression was far more severe than the effects of this Great Recession. And you can see what happened to deficits. You see World War II. And so through time, we've gotten a deficit habit. And we hear an awful lot about that. As a result of all this, now what I'm showing you is ultimate performance. If you were in for your physical exam and your GP had looked at all of the lab reports and says, well, now let's check to see how, if you're really living and how strong you are. Well, this report says, I've got bad news for you. The older you've gotten, the weaker you've become. So when I fit a line through that growth of real GDP, you notice that it is systematically negatively sloped. And so we have this powerful nation, third most populous country in the world, huge ability to create wealth, growing population, Protection of property rights in a lot of ways. Freedom in a lot of ways. And we've got hardening of the arteries. Now, there are some other things that we might look at. I want to glance, I'm going to bounce through this uh, 
this is the important one. I'm gonna, I, might, I might skip another one here in a minute. But this one is crucial. If you look at the federal budget and you identify our spending by category and put it into two, two large sets, one set of expenditures, let's call efficiency enhancing. That's defense, protection of property rights, highways, docks, some funding of education. And if we look at those categories, the categories I'm referring to are those that Adam Smith described as the essential role of government for free people. Then let's put those that have to do with redistributing income, welfare, into another box. What you see here is the result of doing that. Now, we're going back to 1962 and coming forward, and you see the growth of the welfare state, and relatively speaking, the shrinkage, the disappearance of the efficiency state. And those two lines cross where? 1970. 1970. 1970 is also the point, you will remember, where the regulation bar started shooting up. And 1970 is the place where welfare spending began to overshadow efficiency spending, and it has continued. So we have people who have a preference for freedom, but through time, the behavior has changed with respect to how we want to spend our money. I want to skip that one to get to the punchline. During the years that Dot and I lived in Washington, we had a lot of favorite places that we visited. We loved the city. We loved living here. And uh, among the favorite places was the Washington Zoo. And I guess to some extent I liked it a lot because it reminded me of where I worked at the Federal Trade Commission. And uh, that is that uh, all of us at the Federal Trade Commission in one way or another were like animals in a zoo. And, and uh, so when I would go to the zoo, there was a particular animal that I love to see, and the name of that animal is the Tasmanian Devil. How many of you have visited the Washington Zoo? Well, next time you're out there, take, go and see the Tasmanian Devil because he has a corner office, I mean a corner cage. The Tasmanian Devil is interested, it comes from Tasmania, obviously, but anytime you see the Tasmanian Devil, he's running in a circle. As fast, it's almost as if he's performed the calculus and maximized the speed such that he does not fall down. And so here he is, all day long. Every time I've ever been there, Tasmanian Devil, and I used to watch him, and then I thought, well, what am I doing? I'm running in a circle, too, a lot of times, getting nowhere and trying not to fall down. But the creatures that I really loved were the two eagles. There's a pair of eagles out there in the aviary. And uh, I was out there recently, and that pair of eagles was doing the same thing that they've always done when I've been there. That pair of eagles is up as high as they can get in their multi-story cage. It's a big cage with their heads poked out, looking. Now, what do you suppose they're looking at? There are thousands of free birds that are flying around the aviary because there's a lot of food that falls out of the cages. The sky is full of free birds. Now, I don't have any idea what an eagle thinks, but I'm guessing that there's something about the movement of those free birds that is, that is attractive to the eagles. And now the fundamental question is, will or can the eagles soar? If the eagles were let out of their cage, if they were freed from the welfare state of which they have been a part, for a long time. Would they fall to the ground? Or would they try to get back in the cage? I don't know the answer to that. But to some extent, that is what we're talking about. Now let's get to this business of voting with your feet. Uh, when people vote with their feet, and by the way, this reference, voting with your feet, refers to a landmark classic article in economics by Charles Thibault long about 1960, a long time ago, in the American Economic Review. But Charles Thibault developed a theory, a new theory of public finance, as he called it, 
where he said, in a country like America where you have a federalism and you have free mobility, you don't have to get a passport to move from one state to another, if you don't like the way one politician, group of politicians is treating you, if you live in South Carolina, well, then it's no big deal to move to North Carolina. They talk funny, too. Um, and, uh, or maybe if, if that bothers you, move on down to Georgia, or if you're really troubled, move over to Tennessee. They have the same vernacular. It's pretty easy to move around. And so the politician wants to keep his or her job, but they also want to keep their revenue base. And so there's a limit to how much they can abuse the free people. The free people will move. And so Thibault developed this very insightful idea of mobility, voting with your feet as being more important than voting at the ballot box. Because when people really become discouraged, they just get up and leave. Now, when people vote with their feet, where do the brains head? Which states do they pick? Do they move toward freedom? Or are they more attracted to security? And for instance, if, if we could follow these young people, this is Victoria Station there in London. It just happens to be a favorite site of mine. But I would love to follow that crowd of young people and see where they're going. Now, we can't do that very well as economists and social scientists, so we have to do it statistically. It's really hard to get out and follow, you know, a half a million people to see where they go. But the fun thing about it is that we can do that statistically and, and see how they vote with their feet. Now, this map shows you the record of where they went. We're looking at a population of people 25 to 39 years old, single, college educated. That's the most mobile adult component of the American population. And this shows you the result for one particular period, 1995 to 2000. It shows you the states that were shipping them out and the states that were attracting them. Now, in this map, if you want your state to be a winner in this contest, you want it to be blue or green or yellow. Well, yellow is beyond, beyond zero, so that's sort of neutral territory. South Carolina was shipping out college-educated people during the period, and they didn't have to go very far. They may have been going to North Carolina or Georgia. Uh, those states were pulling them in. And uh, those red states, they were pumping them out. So if you happen to be from one of those red states, maybe you could explain why it would be that uh, people would be heading to these other states. This is just the record. And so from the standpoint of statistical modeling, we took that data, and that's our dependent variable, in a statistical regression model. And so we say, we want to explain that number. Now, one of the things that went into the model was an index developed by a sociologist by the name of Richard Florida. Um, he wrote a book a few years ago called The Rise of the Creative Class. And he assigned values, numbers, an index for every state in the United States. They are ordered 1 to 50 in terms of creativity. It's what I call a cool index. Or you might call it way cool. And so if you want these people to come to your state, Florida was suggesting you want to be cool, way cool. And so in his index, he has about 10 variables. Now this shows you the result of that index. These are the cool states, the coolest, those that are purple. Texas is way cool, right? California is cool. And you can see for yourself, uh, South Carolina is not cool at all. Now, you can stir this pot a lot, and a lot of people have, and Tate and I have stirred it some as well, and as you get down into the bottom of the pot, there's some pretty interesting stuff there, but we took this index that Florida developed and updated it in some cases, but stuck that in our equation. We wanted to see, will that index explain the movement of these people when they vote with their feet? And so, for those of you who like to look at equations and feel like your day has been wasted if you have not seen one, uh, I'll give you this so that you will cheer up and feel good. Um, let's look at the equation. The equation is just a statement that says, hey, migration can be explained by 
uh, per capita income. That is, we think, well, maybe people like to go to places where incomes are higher as opposed to lower. And uh, the size or the number of people who are employed in professions. Young professionals, we're thinking, like to be around other young professionals. So we stick that in. You can see the other variables in the Economic Freedom Index, and that's broken into two parts. There's a part called the Fiscal Freedom Index, and then Richard Florida's Creativity Index. And what did we learn? When you put all those variables in the model, income does not matter. In other words, our model says these young professional go-getters, college educated, when they are shifting around looking for the next location, other things matter more than income. What other things matter more than income? Our study said they are attractive to a large PBS sector. That is, they love Washington, D.C. This is Mecca for a large professional sector, and people like to be around other people like them. If you are from a state that has a little one, then you can get out and wave the folks goodbye as they leave your state, is what this is saying. Economic freedom is a strong, strong positive. But it's within economic freedom that we found the real power. These people act as though they hate taxes. That is, the coefficient on that variable is big and it's negative. And it says to any state, if you want to bring young professionals to live in your state, you better get your taxes down. And so freedom was important here. They hate taxes, and they love cool states. They like to go where you can have fun on Saturday night, where there's a wonderful music scene. They like to go to states that are accepting of people from all walks of life, all kinds of cultures, people who might be viewed as different in some other states. They like openness. And so this study said, okay, these young people seem to have a preference that says freedom is important. Well, we wanted to go a little bit further, and so this gets us to that study that I mentioned to you. What about the international movers? Now, many of you have lived in other countries. I have for brief periods of time. That's not an unusual scene in some parts of the world. That is, it may look kind of humorous to us today. We probably don't see anybody making a move down the interstate uh, with that much stuff stacked on top of the car. But in other parts of the world, mo movement uh, sometimes requires that. And, and so when they move, what moves them? Other than that Peugeot that we see that is loaded down. You know, is it freedom? Do they want to go to cities? Is it income? Is it the rise of a knowledge economy? I just want to interrupt you real quick, mm -hmm. if you could kind of dab off. Okay, yeah, Peugeot. yeah, thanks. We are memorializing this uh, lecture, so uh, if, you, if you think you feel sorry for yourself, you can th feel sorry for future generations as well, because this thing's going to be canned. They'll probably cut that, they'll cut out what I just said, I expect, when, we'll see. when it comes time. It may be the best part, so it, that's, a, that's really a hard decision. But so this is a question about internationals. And uh, I mentioned the Knowledge Economy Index. To do this, we had to build an index, and this is some of Tate's work. We had to build an index for every state ranking the states on the rise of the new economy. We've got an old economy and a new economy. The new economy in the U.S. and the world is referred to as the knowledge economy. Brains matter more than brawn. For example, to get a job at BMW's manufacturing plant, which is 30 minutes from my home, you have to have at least two years of college. If you have less than that, you will not be able to operate the sophisticated processes in that plant. They are part of a knowledge economy. That doesn't mean you have to have a PhD to be a part of a knowledge economy. But high school diplomas won't get it anymore in so many occupations. And so we had to build an index, so we built an index for the knowledge economy. And what you can see there is how the index was built and things that were included in it but let me show you what it looks like. This is the result for the knowledge economy. Now you can identify your state. And again, uh, if you really want to rank high in this story, you want to be green or you want to be blue, or maybe at worst yellow, in terms of the knowledge economy index for 2008. So 
these uh, green and blue states and yellow, pretty much dominant west of the Mississippi. That is, if you want to divide the country into two parts, it's west of the Mississippi where you avoid all of this red that is down there in the middle. That gives you an idea where the knowledge economy is located. And for those of you who are thinking about a career that goes beyond Washington, D.C., and wondering where you might locate, you might look at this map and say, wow, maybe I better think about Colorado. <laughs> All right? Or one of these other high-knowledge states. Now, interestingly enough, I would say paradoxically, Michigan ranks high as a knowledge economy state. And that's what the data tell us. And it's obviously a state that is in, in a rip-roaring transition right now, but they're doing the right things to attract knowledge workers, which is truly interesting. Now, uh, this is something else we put in. Mercatus has built a freedom index. It has two parts to it. One part is personal freedom. The other part is economic freedom. Now, personal freedom, uh, we could take an example. <laughs> Uh, if you live in a state where it is illegal to sell certain products on Sunday or certain hours of the day, that relates to personal freedom. If you have to get a permit to be a hairdresser or a barber or an economist or a school teacher, that's economic freedom. And so they looked at about 150 different variables to build an index, an overall index, and then a two-part index. Uh, and this tells you the states that are high on freedom. That's green and blue. Yellow is borderline. And then you can see the states that are brown or red. Uh, the, uh, as I recall, Tate, uh, New York is 50th. California is 49th. And so now you have an interesting kind of paradox. Those two states are very high as knowledge economy states, but they're very low in terms of freedom and we could infer from this that the populations, the stable population of California and the stable population of New York is made up of people who do not have a preference for freedom. They prefer something else. Or either they're insane. And economists don't like to try to figure out how insane people operate. So if we assume they're rational, and we assume that they vote and they interact, and through many, many years, they have reduced freedom, then we infer from that that they prefer something else. And those who don't like that vote with their feet, and population is leaving California and New York, going somewhere else. And we will look at where they're going. Now, when we uh, put the uh, knowledge economy index on one axis and economic freedom on the other axis, and locate the 50 states, now we can corral some states. Down in that lower left-hand corner are states that are high on freedom and high on knowledge economy. And I would forecast those states to be in the vanguard in the future for economic development in the United States. And so if you wanted to jot down 10 states that might be bright prospects, for future growth. Those would be, according to our analysis, your best shot. Then if you wanted to steer away from those states that are low on freedom and low on knowledge economy, that's the Northeast Quadrant. And so that says stay away from Kentucky, stay away from West Virginia. That's what the chart is saying. Stay away from New Mexico and Florida, move on down there. What have we got the most far? Colorado, again. Head out to Colorado, that seems to be the place to locate. It is also the place that has the highest share of its population with bachelor's degrees in terms of the adult population. So Colorado is a very interesting place. All right, now, here's our model. You get to see another equation. Now we're explaining migration. Migration, both with respect to people who live in the United States, move to another state. Then we run the same model for people who live in another country and move to a state in the United States, there are variables, knowledge economy, overall freedom, Richard Florida's creativity index, cost of living, we figured that wouldn't matter, 
per capita income and average population, which is to say the bigger the population, the more people would tend to be attracted there. And so there's our model. Now, what I'm showing you here is a mapping of international migration and domestic migration. Now look carefully here. On the horizontal axis, we are ranking the states from the top state attracting foreign migrants to the bottom, one through 50. On the vertical axis, the top state attracting domestic migration, one through 50. Southwest corner, that's migration mecca. I have colored the states black or either dark blue that gained seats in the House of Representatives announced two weeks ago. You will notice that we have cornered here those states that gain seats. They are in the southwest quadrant. There's something about those states that's very attractive, not just to domestic, but also to international movers. And so this says if you want to gain more representation in the United States Congress, you better hope people come to your state. And, of course, the international migration will not count unless they become citizens in that game. But we can see the losing states and the winning states in this. What did we learn? First, people like cities. In other words, if you want to call out what it is that is explaining the decision of a person in the United States to go to another state, the first thing you would predict is they will go where there are cities. South Carolina doesn't have any, okay, <laughs> all right. That is the closest thing we have to a city is a place that has two million population and people would not likely call that a city when we talk about big cities. And so South Carolina, for example, we lack big cities. Some people say that's wonderful, but it also works against the migration of people to your state. The next thing would be international movers head towards highly ranked knowledge economy states, but not domestic movers. That's probably because part of our data is biased by federal law we ration, of course, international movement into our country, but we have exceptions for people who are in certain scarce professions. And those would be people who would have highly trained computer skills, other kinds of scientific skills. And so they have a better chance of getting a ticket to this country. Our data shows they move where those knowledge economies are largest. Domestic movers are indifferent to that. They're both high on overall economic freedom. And cool locations matter to domestics, but the internationals couldn't give a damn. They don't know what cool is. Their definition of cool is different, all right? They know what cool is for them, but it's not what cool is for us, apparently. Personal freedom matters to international movers, but not domestic movers. And so, to me, this was one of the most interesting parts of our finding. Freedom matters, but it matters most to international migrants. Because it matters along two dimensions. Now, I would suggest to you that that's the story of our country. The story of our country is about people who came here from somewhere else looking for lots of things, but one of the things that was a driver was freedom. And then that suggests that if we ever close ourselves off from that migrating population, we might have closed ourselves off to a population of people that prefer freedom. And that through time, the existing population would become more interested this follows from what I've just said, more interested in transfers and welfare than in an efficiency enhancing government. That's what these things might suggest, and I'll be happy to 
hear some of your ideas about that. Now, where does this come from? Uh, quite a number of years ago, the uh, library at Clemson, where I taught for many years, the librarian sent a note. This was back when they actually sent letters before the digital day. Sent a letter to all the faculty members saying, we're going to assemble a display of faculty members' favorite books in the lobby, in the lobby of the library. Stack them up. Big mountain of books. And we'll put cards on them. Professor Yandel's favorite book. And uh, they said, if you'd like to participate, please send us the name of the book that's your favorite, and we'll pull it out of our collection and put it in the display. And I wrote back, said, yes, I'd like to be a part of it. Here's my favorite book. And I got a letter back saying, thank you, Professor Yandel. We don't have that book in our collection. But if you have a copy, personal copy, that you will lend to the university, we'll take good care of it. And I wrote back and I said, as a matter of fact, I have two copies. So I'll be glad to bring one. That's my favorite book. So the little engine that could was stacked up along with Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations or whatever else other faculty members considered to be their favorite book. And, and there was my little engine that could with a card that says Professor Yandel's favorite book. The day the display was opened, I got a call from a student saying, is this Professor Yandel? And I said, it certainly is. And he says, what are you teaching this next semester? And I rattled it off and he said, it doesn't matter what you're teaching, I want to take your course. And I said, why? He says, if you're crazy enough to think the little engine that could is your favorite book, I just want to come in and hear what you have to say. And so I was able to attract one student on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the little engine that could, the author is named uh, Waddy Piper, but that's not really the author. That's a, a nom de plume that was invented by by the publisher. Nobody knows who wrote that story down. They just put a name on it and called it Waddy Piper's book. Uh, it's a bestseller, has been for many, many years in children's literature. And by the way, the little engine that could is female. If those of you who might remember reading this story or having it read to you by your parents or someone who loves you, the little engine is a she, not a he. All right. So there may be something there, too, that's kind of powerful. But the little engine that could had to get up and go to carry all the children and the toys to the town. And uh, there it is chugging away. Most people remember the theme song of the little engine that could. What is it? What does the little engine say? Does anybody remember? I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And so the little engine that could has a theme of optimism and a theme of achievement. Right. Now, when we think about the theme of achievement, uh, the theme of achievement, according to a psychologist, has to do with people who want to accomplish something. I want to become something. I want to do something. It's all about acting. And in order to be a part of a community where you might be able to actualize your psychological needs, the psychologists refer to these things as needs, in order to actualize those needs, you've got to be in a community where there's freedom. The absence of freedom, it doesn't matter what you want to become, your life has been set for you, be happy. And so the need for achievement then perhaps can be tied to David McClellan's motivation research and work that he did when he built an index called the N index or the N achievement index. McClellan and other psychologists, other social psychologists, define three basic psychological needs that human beings have. It's an oversimplification just as most of the models in economics are oversimplifications. That's when they have power. So there are three psychological needs. One is the need for achievement. Now this isn't to suggest that everybody has all of this in the same doses. The other is a need for affiliation. A need for affiliation says, I like people and I want to get along. I want to get along with people. If anybody's having a party, I want to be there. 
I love parties, I love people, I like to be liked. That's a need for affiliation. Now these are not competing sets when you think about them. The other need is a need for power. I want to be in charge. I want to be up standing in front saying, follow me, got power. And it could go with achievement. And so in, in David McClellan's work, as he developed this idea, they decided uh, in his work particularly to look at about 30 countries in the world and to measure the need for achievement and affiliation and power by reading children's books. Okay? Now think about this for a minute. If you think about a stable society of people, a community of people, in equilibrium with respect to their preferences, one of the things that shows up is the curriculum at the grammar school. What they teach in grammar school is important to this population of people. And so if you wanted to know what's important in this country or that country or that country, you would compare the primary grade curriculum and see what they teach. Because the idea is that the people who run the schools aren't fools. They're part of the community of people whose children go to the schools. Now David McClellan and his researchers who went all over the world assumed something similar with respect to what grammar school children read. They assumed that parents and the population that chooses the books reflected important social norms in their decisions. And so they went to these 30 countries and they identified I think 25 books for each country that were in the requirements of first, second, third grade. What are these children reading? Then they took those books, translated them all into English, put them all in identical format so that a reader would not be biased by the language or the format. Then they had researchers count the number of times the theme of achievement or the theme of affiliation, or the theme of power, showed up every 25 lines. And when they got through, that was their index. And what they found is wide variation in the frequency of those themes across countries. Then after they built their indices, guess what they did? They said, we're going to forecast that GDP growth 25 years later will be higher for those countries with a high need for achievement. And it will be lower for those countries that have a high need for affiliation, so forth. They churned some data, they tested their hypothesis, and this was pretty crude stuff when they did it. And they supported their hypothesis. Now, now there's a wonderful woman uh, who uh, was doing her work at the University of Chicago, got interested in David McClellan's work, and then she did a very muscular econometrics test and got very powerful results. But, but let's look at this a little bit, and, and then at the very end I'm going to tell you, well, how on earth does Dolly Parton get involved here? Anyone, does everyone know who Dolly Parton is? Okay. So how does this wonderful country singer get involved here? And I'll give you a, I'll give you a quick, quick answer to the question, and then we will look closely. Dolly Parton has set up a foundation because, in a sense, she believes what David McClellan said. That if you can get children reading early in their homes, before they go to school, the right books then they will be better people in the sense of accomplishing things. And so she has set up a foundation, and I think the last count I saw, she has sent out 25 million books. For about $35, you can provide a book that will be mailed to a child once a month. Dot and I support, I guess, 25, 30 students, children. Comes in the mail. In order to sign up, someone has to sign a pledge, I will read this book to this child. So there has to be a reader. Every child in the state of Tennessee, theoretically, is now part of our program. Every child in West Virginia, 
Every child in the province of Ontario, most of the United Kingdom. Now, she doesn't give this stuff away. It's all private. There have to be sponsors. Rotary International is a big sponsor. So all that I'm reporting to you now is that there's some folks that have gotten pretty interested in this idea, but, but let's look uh, a little bit of elaboration here on what these needs are. From the psychologist standpoint, this is sort of giving in a more cogent way what I was describing to you earlier. And let's think about some other children's books. I mentioned the little engine. What's the little red head about? Is that about achievement? Is that about affiliation? Or is that about power? What do the little red hen say? Anybody know? Do you remember? You don't remember the little red hen? She said, who's going to help me plant the grain? Who's going to help me grind the corn? Who's going to help me make the muffins? Nobody would help. Well, I'll do it myself. So it's about resourcefulness. Uh, Jack and the Beanstalk, probably about power. As you look at these different children's books, you begin to get a little bit of flavor of what I'm talking about. But some of these may be books that... Uh, the Velveteen Rabbit. I sent, uh, I sent out an email request. I do this from time to time. I'll just pick maybe the first hundred names in my address book. And I'll send out a note to whoever those hundred people are saying, I'm doing some research. And I want to have several questions I'd like to ask you. And so I did that on favorite books. So I sent this note out to 100 people. Some of them were professors. Some of them were secretaries in offices. Just some of them were my kin people. Whatever's in that first 100 names. And I said, did you have a favorite book as a child that someone read to you? What was it? Do you have a story associated with that book? And uh, I got the most beautiful story about the Velveteen Rabbit from a lawyer. I'd never read that. Anybody here ever read the Velveteen Rabbit? It's a wonderful story. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes when you don't have anything else to read, check it out. I bet your library has a copy of the Velveteen Rabbit. Wonderful. It's an old book, probably pre published about 1930. But the Ugly Duckling, affiliation. Affiliation. I want to be able to get along. So these themes, oh, now where the wild things are. And, and you know, uh, Sendek uh, was inspired to write his book by his kin folks. This was about his kin people, his uncles and aunts and so forth. And when he was a little bitty child, he had an uncle who would come into his room and Sendak said his uncle would come in and his uh, uncle would say to Sendak, I love you so much, I'm just going to eat you up. <laughs> Have you ever heard anybody say that? He said, I, I love you so much I could just eat you up. He took it literally. <laughs> and uh, so later as he talks about where the wild things are, they were inspired by his ten people. Uh, there was work done in ancient Greece taking the ideas of David McClellan and then looking at growth of markets. They used amphora. The big vases were used as, they were like our modern containers. Exports of products from the cities of Greece were shipped in amphora, you know, these great big vessels. And just like our containers, the receiving community didn't know what to do with all these things, they just stacked them up. Just as we don't know what to do with all the containers. They just get stacked up. It's cheaper to build a new one in China and ship it here than to send an old one back. And so the same thing was true with the amphora. They were able to identify the growth of markets by the location of amphora that are just stacked up out there. Then they read Greek literature and identified the frequency of themes of achievement and how that frequency increased. And then tracked the growth of those economies. Fascinating stuff. Um, this one is uh, sort of interesting. There were some researchers who read street ballads, poetry, stories from medieval England, <clears throat> did the same thing, measured these themes, and then looked at 
I guess it was C code. There it is. That's their data. What you're looking at here is shipments of coal imports into London mapped against the frequency of the theme of achievement in literature, all of the literature, a sample of all the literature of the country at that time. Well, this was McClellan's, the countries that McClellan used, and, uh, uh, and I've given you sort of a shorthand introduction to what he learned. Uh, let's see what I've got here. That there are some of the data points. That's, let's see if I might have a little bit more. There's Dolly. Here we go. This is Dolly Parton's Imagination Library, located in Sevierville, Tennessee, which is where she was born, or she was born out in the sticks from Sevierville. And it uh, tells you a little bit about her program. All right, we've, we've, we've traveled a long trip here. Uh, let's go back and recap a little bit, and then, uh, if we have time, from your standpoint, uh, enter entertain some questions and discussion, and it may be on something else, which would be fine. We started with a question about preference for freedom. Do people prefer freedom? The question then uh, was, co we <coughs> confronted the great American bread machine. And I suggested to you that there's something about the development, the modern development of the U.S. economy that suggests a kind of hardening of the arteries has occurred. And when we try to pinpoint, well, when did it start and when did it get serious, I picked the 1970. Then I showed you some data that reflected my choice. The growth of the regulatory state, what I call regulatory capitalism, begins about 1970. And then we looked at spending through the federal budget and how that composition changed dramatically with an origin in 1970, where we as a people decided that we preferred to spend more money on welfare and transfers than on efficiency enhancing aspects of government services. So, so we looked at those things as sort of evidence that, hey, we've got hardening of the arteries. Is there something about freedom that we're missing? And then we took a sort of a giant step that was almost disjoint as we moved and said, well, let's explore what tends to motivate people as they move about. Does freedom matter? If it does matter, then how does that reflect on what's happening to our country? And I reported to you uh, two or three pieces of research that focused on domestic movers and then international movers. The evidence says freedom does matter. And it says, interestingly enough, at least to me, in a marginal way, it matters more to the international mover. And then at the last part, which is what we just concluded, we explored the question, well, where do these preferences come from? And I suggested to you that David McClellan's work on achievement motivation might shed some light, and we've explored that. Now, one last point. There's some interesting literature out there. I'm currently reading it uh, in psychology, sociology, economics, that looks and identifies this need for achievement with respect to migration. Now remember, our migration studies didn't have need for achievement in the equation. We don't have that in there. But it turns out that some people have been doing this research. They can now discriminate as between populations of people in the United States who move within their own state versus people from that same state that move away to another state. And now the psychological testing that has been for samples tells us something. There's a central tendency that says people who move to another state fill in the blank with respect to need for achievement. What do you think? The people who move to another state, you think of some of your friends in high school or college, the ones who stayed, the ones who moved, it's never safe to look at one person and say, aha, I know something about you. We're talking about large numbers and central tendencies. But the people who move to other states, leave home, have a higher need for achievement than the people who move within the state. They have a higher need for affiliation. 
I have friends, I have family, and that's important to me. That's a kind of proxy for affiliation. And so the further people move, some of the studies suggest, the greater the need for achievement. In other words, I just got to get out of here. I have, a grand, I have a granddaughter who's saying that right now, driving my son and his wife crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I expect uh, there's something there about my son that did the same thing for me and God at one time. Yeah. I just got to get out of here. Please, I've got to have freedom. But anyhow, let me stop there. I think there is a way to try to knit some of this together, but it's a pretty loose knit uh, that we do. Um, questions? Other questions? Other topics? Anything you can So, um, on the migration data, I presume that you have a fair bit of cross-correlation in your explanatory variables. So, can we really say that we know that people are moving because of freedom? The, uh, when you do a, a uh, Pearson correlation matrix, anytime you are modeling human behavior using economic models, you will have some correlation. I don't remember that those Tate, you might remember. I don't remember that we had what would be thought of as severe correlation, greater than 50%, for example. Uh, so you always have that. Uh, anytime you do any econometric work, looking at human behavior, social data, you will get it. And so the best you can do is draw the inference. You can run the model with one variable at a time. And sometimes that gives you some insights. We did some of that, but quite frankly, I don't remember specifically with respect to that variable. But based on the work that we've done and others have done using that variable, I would bet that it matters. Which is to say there may be some statistical noise in there, but that it does have an independent effect on that population of people. Tate, do you have any memories uh, more specific that I would say that's a pretty good summation. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this kind of, st what you're raising, the question that's being raised is the, kinds of, is the kind of problem that haunts all statistical work when you're using social and economic variables. And that is, it is very hard to get a clean separation as between the independent variables themselves. Uh, but generally speaking, you try more than one experiment, and if you're going to publish something in a professional journal, which we've done, the reviewers of that manuscript are the ones who try to take you to task. And it's their job to try to destroy your work. That's, that's really what it's about. But I would say, I would bet that it's, that it's there. Did, you, did I see a hand up here? Oh. Yes. <coughs> um, you mentioned that countries and communities that value affinity um, have a negative correlation with GDP growth. Yes. Do you have, um, I mean, do you expand upon why you think that is, what the explanation is for that? The, um, there, everyone got the question, and, and I had made a statement which you uh, accurately repeated. Uh, if, we, if we look at samples of countries with respect to David McClellan's work, and we focus first on those that have the high need for achievement, 25 years later, there's some positive nudge to GDP growth the higher that index, and with affiliation, lower. When I looked at the countries, um, and that's always dangerous to say, well, I'm going to look at the countries and see which ones have the high and low. In some cases, it caused me to begin to think, if you are a part, if you as a human being are part of a country that has no history of economic progress. Okay. Can you picture yourself being a parent in a country where there has been no economic progress in three, four, five generations? No one has ever experienced growth in income. There are a lot of places like that, particularly in the time when he was doing his research. He was looking at data from 1925 on into the 40s and 50s and then projecting forward. But if you lived in a country where, where there is no such thing as progress in a meaningful sense, would you read the little engine that could to your children? Would you say, you know, if you work hard enough, you're going to get ahead. 
think about doing something in your life, you want to go to college. If you don't know anyone who's ever been to college, if there's no such thing as going to college, I'm exaggerating here. Or if you are a part of a command and control economy, where you have to get all kinds of permissions and forms in order to even move from one county to the other, which was the case in Eastern Europe. You could not leave your home county. <coughs> so if you're growing up in that, I began to think, if I were a parent in that environment, I don't think that I would be trying to communicate this idea of need for achievement because I would be, I think, causing a lot of frustration to get into the mind and life of my son or daughter. That's the reflection on your question. Um, Dot and I were, we were living in Munich, Germany when Czechoslovakia, what is now Czech, uh, Slovakia and Czech Republic, but when Czechoslovakia got its freedom, the Russians left while we were there. Um, we got on a train and uh, went to Prague. This was about 1991. We saw families in automobiles as we made our trip. They put big signs on the side of their car. We are free. It was the first time they had ever been able to leave their country. Couldn't leave. Uh, we had this wonderful tour there in Prague. This was in 91. It was so cold, we were just about frozen. But it was wonderful. The tour guide was a man who had learned English by going to the U.S. Embassy secretly. He could have been put in prison for life for learning English. That was the kind of regime that was present and had been there for a long, long time. And that happened to have been a Russian regime. We could fill in the blank for other countries, other places, other times with something similar. I'm reflecting on your question. Uh, that is, I can think of situations where I, as a parent, without thinking why, would pick certain stories and books for my children. And then in another situation, I might pick different stories and books and songs for my children, depending on the openness and the degree to which there's some probability of being able to break through the walls and, and become something. And I think that shows up, shows up in this. Uh, if you're a part of a bureaucratic environment, you really want to get along. It's very important to have that highly developed need for affiliation. Yes, sir. Uh, the commonly accepted narrative in policy circles is that um, people are leaving Rust Belt states to head to the south. Yes. And when I was looking at those maps, your migration research, it's certainly reflected in that, but not necessarily to the strength or severity that it's kind of the narrative today that you know the South is going to boom, and that South Carolina, North Carolina, that's that's where a lot of the yeah. progress is going. Do you think that the narrative is just too strong, and that there's other places outside of the American South where domestic migration and things like that are going to pick up, or uh, or is there another explanation? I would say if you if you carved into that data and stirred it a good bit, uh, that your conclusion would more likely be that people are moving west of the Mississippi to the southwest, and then a band of states that sweep up from Texas to Oregon, Utah, so forth, Idaho, cut across Colorado, high movement in that direction. Um, if you were looking at GDP growth for states, state GDP growth, the high growth in the United States is in the middle. It's those wonderful square states that have been losing population. But it's South Dakota, it's North Dakota, it's Nebraska. It's coming on down, it's Colorado, it's Texas, and so forth. That is, if you were coloring states on the basis of GDP growth, that's the bright part of our country. The muscle of our country is in the middle. The migration patterns don't necessarily reflect that muscle. Part of that muscle is reflected because of energy, natural gas, coal, ethanol, so forth, oil. But there's more to it than that. Those states are also the states that have the highest educational attainment. That's where the brains are in our country, on a per capita basis. So uh, 
I would say there's that the story for the South is weaker, except for old people like me. That is, uh, there are a lot of people. We've got the baby boomers retiring, as you know. That first wave of baby, baby boomers is now at the retirement point. And uh, the South East gets more than its share of retirement growth. So that's a migration component that is driving in that, in that area. Um, but I think if you looked at the 25 to 39, category now, it would be drifting towards, as I described, Texas on up to Oregon. Uh, even Cal California is still attracting some of these go-getters, even though they're losing a lot of population total. But I, I wish the prospects were brighter uh, for the state where I live, my state, South Carolina, but uh, it's not all that good. It's not bad. We are a growing population but um, the growth is primarily a bunch of old people like me. And uh, they don't necessarily make good citizens, <laughs> which is to say they don't want to support public activities. <laughs> they want their taxes zero. Yes, sir. So when this mechanism of TBU choice that you mentioned is, uh, is active, it seems like there are going to be two different tendencies that governments will fall into. One is they can collude like monopolists, and all raise taxes together. Uh, and you see that in the way that industrialized countries have kind of smacked down Caribbean tax havens, for instance. But the other tendency will be to defect from the prisoner's dilemma. It's essentially, right? Like Delaware has, it's very easy to set up a, a, a corporation there. So I, my, my question for you is, which of these two tendencies do you think will tend to predominate in the long run? Okay. The, uh, we've just been given refutable hypotheses and uh, the uh, question uh, would make a wonderful topic for a master's thesis, maybe a dissertation. Uh, and part of the work's been done, which is always the case. That is, when you raise a question, um, most of the time, there's some meaningful work that's been done that relates to your question. But generally speaking, the total work has not been done. Something that comes to my mind, that is, we're talking about Charles Thibault. And Thibault's hypothesis says that, in a sense, he says, the United States will become what we are. When you look at a map of the United States, an outline map of the 50 states, and you measure anything, you get wide variation across space. For instance, the Economic Freedom Index. You get dramatic differences in economic freedom as measured on a state-to-state -state basis. You get big differences between Vermont and Connecticut, for example. Uh, the state's New Hampshire is just there by itself, and you wonder, why did they put that on their license plates, live free or die? Mm -hmm. And when you look at the data for New Hampshire, by George, they seem to believe it. And you know, look at where they are, and you say, well, how could it be that these people would be so different from their neighbors over in Massachusetts? But they are. And I would suggest the reason they are is because Tebow was right. Those people who didn't prefer that just made a short trip and moved to Massachusetts, or moved from Massachusetts to New Hampshire. That is to say that the map of the United States would be a quilt uh, with very different color patches and norms if we did not have the federal piece to this. The quilt would be even more dramatic, I would say, in terms of color and tone and shades if we didn't have strong state government. But there's been a tendency since World War II towards centralization. In states, it's been a movement towards empowering the state government to take over what had been done by municipalities and counties, what used to be called home rule. Where you had strong home rule, you could have a bunch of oddballs who were happy in a community and they did it their way and nobody wanted to live there but these crazy nuts. <laughs> and I think that's wonderful. That's America. And people who don't want to live around those crazy nuts can just go live somewhere else. But as we move to centralization at the state and then at the federal level, you begin to erode the meaningfulness of the Tebow effect, is what I would suggest. Well, and then we might say, well, what might explain why we would get that kind of erosion and centralization? And 
what we are talking about here is reflected in the count of pages of the Federal Register. I wrote a long journal article on this trying to explain why did regulation move from states to the federal government? Uh, that is, if you look at environmental regulation, there are some people who think we didn't have any until 1970 when the EPA was created. And then, of course, in my writing, I say, well, there are 300 years of common law before that. And it was different across the states. States did things dramatically different, but almost every population did not want to die from pollution. Mm -hmm. But they did it different. The movement to the federal level, or the movement to the state level, I think is reflective of bootleggers and Baptists and rent-seeking organizations who want to write uniform rules. It's easier to live with one set of rules instead of 50. And it's particularly easier to live with one set of rules if you can raise your competitor's costs, which you can do with federal regulation. So uh, your question brings up, I think, a lot that we might want to stir, and maybe some of you would be inspired to uh, do a thesis on it at some time, and I'd be happy to serve on your committee at no pride, no charge, because uh, I like that particular area. Any other, another question? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I was, I'd like to refer to the creativity index you yes. mentioned. And I was wondering, how can you be sure that it's causation one way and not the other? As in, yep. uh, how can you be sure that young people moving into an area doesn't affect the creativity index? You can't. The, and, and in a sense, there's no way ever to deal with causation. I mean, the only way you can deal with causation is to have models that maybe with enough lag. For instance, Richard Florida didn't have a creativity index, and that doesn't mean that you wouldn't build one. We could go back and build creativity indices. But, uh, but in a sense, uh, everything that we do in life is a simultaneous model, simultaneous equation. It's a system of simultaneous equations. And so every dependent variable is an independent variable somewhere else. That's what we are. You know, we're this system of equations in a sense so that you have causality running in both directions. Sometimes you can address the problem by putting in lags. That is, I'm looking at certain behavior before this occurred in a time sense. And that way you, you may be able to get around it some, but you really can't solve the problem so that you say, damn it, I've got it fixed now and I know that uh, that there's causation in just one direction, which is what I have predicted. Because surely you're, you're correct. Uh, because we, we know that when some dramatic things happen in communities, they suddenly became creative. That is when Oak Ridge, Tennessee became the location for the US work on nuclear bombs and a huge number of PhD scientists and families move into the Appalachian Mountains of Tennessee. You gotta believe that town changed. You know, in a matter of a short time, they probably had the best public school system in America. And they had this large population of what we now call professionals. There in what was a wonderful little old hick town in, in Tennessee. And so they got to be very creative. Now, I kind of think those hicks were pretty creative, too, but, th but th that doesn't fit Richard Florida's <laughs> index. <laughs> but your question is a good one. Uh, but don't let those kinds of haunting problems keep you from doing empirical work. But when you do empirical work, be humble about it. Uh, that is, we do not find the truth. In a sense, is what your question is saying. We do not find the truth but we are able to make inferences based on a rigorous display of logic and data that someone else can attack, build on, and maybe add a little bit more. And maybe we get another millimeter closer to truth, but maybe not. But that's the search we're all a part of. 